I've been thinking about how uh, repetitive my message might seem in light of what has gone on before, but I bear in mind the 136th Psalm where there is a refrain about the mercy of the Lord that endures forever and it loses no power by the end of the psalm. Uh, the, ha the word hallelujah, imagine how many millions, trillions of times that word has been voiced by man throughout the ages and yet it still does not lose any power. With that, I, I want you to consider uh, these words that were recorded by our brother and apostle John about what he saw at the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. He saw a book written within and on the back side sealed with seven seals. He saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, and that's everywhere, no man was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Amen. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain. That's important. When you see Christ in glory, you still know what price he paid for us. Amen. He is a king. Amen. He is exalted. He is at the right hand of the majesty on high, but he is still a lamb as it had been slain. Mm -hmm. Having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Seven horns, a good picture of perfect power. He's omnipotent. Seven eyes, a great picture of complete knowledge. He's omniscient. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. That's every people group. Every conceivable division of man will have saints come out of them. You have a, a, a thrice-fold praise that goes through here. You have here the beasts and the elders saying, Thou art worthy. Next, you see that uh, the voice of many angels. What they also said in verse 10 was that he has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. The voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders. The number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. And what they said with a loud voice was, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Again, he is the worthy one. He is the worthy lamb. And there is ever that reminder that he was slain. He was offered. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such are as in the sea and all that are in them, and that's all the creatures, heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sits upon the throne and unto the lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that lives forever and ever. Amen. Seeing the Lamb of God prompts praise every time you see him. Now the message tonight is focusing upon Christ entering into the holiest of holies by his blood. Remembering back uh, in your mind through history, lamb after lamb and bull after bull through the centuries of time that Israel did these things, they kept pointing forward, kept pointing to a lamb that was going to come. There had to be another one and another one and another one because it just wasn't doing it. It just wasn't doing the job that needed done. They kept pointing, pointing forward. But after the death of the true lamb, those sacrifices became pointless. There was no meaning in them any longer. They were only echoes of what had been. They were shadows dissolved by the coming of the light of the world. And 40 years after the death of Christ, the temple sacrifice was permanently ended, as if there was any doubt, when Rome 
destroyed Jerusalem. Now, I do need to note this. God used Rome just like he used Babylon six centuries before. If God had not allowed it, there is no way Rome would have taken Jerusalem out. No way at all. God has always fought for his people, but when he allows it, then they have the power. Now, our text, I could say that our text tonight is the, is the whole of Scripture for the sacred and scarlet thread runs from beginning to end. From the very first uh, atonement that God himself enacted to cover his people all the way to the end where we get to go back to the tree of life, where we see this lamb slain, there is a scarlet thread. We don't have time, of course, for that. Maybe in glory we will. When there is no time, maybe you begin to look at some of those things. I certainly, maybe I'll be more capable of, of those things. Or we could just focus upon the old covenant writings then because the whole thrust of their message that God was giving his people was Christ is coming and his blood will atone. All the way through you see Christ. Or we could just look at the law, the first five. But instead we're going to look at the book of Hebrews and in particular chapter 9. Turn there please at this time. We will be staying in, in Hebrews 9 for the most of our time this evening. Now, I'm going to say Paul. You're going to hear me say Paul all the way through here. I'm not going to say the writer of Hebrews, the author of Hebrews. I'm going to say Paul. I have, if you, if you want to talk about who wrote it, I think it's Paul. I don't see how it could be anybody else. To make it somebody else is to make it someone that's outside the canon of accepted writings now. You come up with a Paulus or Priscilla, I've even heard suggested, or some other crazy ideas. Who else could write this but a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee? Who else would be so intimate, not only with the knowledge of the law and the shift in the covenants, but, but the great Apostle Paul? Who else would write about Timothy in the last chapter and call him our brother Timothy? And he's going to be set at liberty soon and so on and so forth. There's other reasons. I have to say that in case any of you bristle when I say Paul. So Paul writes in the spirit here. Now even the first covenant had regulations of divine worship and the earthly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle prepared, the outer one, in which were the lampstand and the table and the sacred bread. This is called the holy place. And behind the second veil there was a tabernacle which is called the holy of holies, or the most holy place, having a golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden jar holding manna and Aaron's rod which budded and the tables of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. But of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Now I can say that just like Paul did, but he says it for a different reason. He could not speak in detail because of time and because of space. I could not speak in detail because of a lack of knowledge. I really want to talk to the apostle about these very issues when we get there to glory. What was that more you were going to say but couldn't because of time? What was it about these? I, I see some things. Um, one thing I want you to notice is that in this, this is all pointing to Christ. When you look at these, you're going to see Jesus. Now, and, and this is not arresting. This is not uh, allegorizing. This is just acknowledging that this is the way God works. He establishes something. He begins to teach his people, and then he shows them the fullness. Uh, Brother Given has pointed this out about the case in, in the garden where Adam sees all the animals come in pairs, and he doesn't have a, another half, and then Eve is presented to him. And that's a principle throughout Scripture. God prepares the people and then gives them the fullness. So consider this, that as you look at this, you see the lamp stand. Now, there's many things you'll read in a lot of commentaries about that. All I want to note is Christ is the light of the world. It, there's a similarity there. That's all I want to suggest. There is the table, the sacred bread. Christ himself said he is the bread sent down from heaven. There, there was the uh, golden altar of incense, which we, we could talk about prayers there. We could talk about God's presence with that as well. You have the ark. You have the jar, the rod, the tables. The last three divide nicely into promise, priesthood, and precept. The promise of the manna when it came, the priesthood of Aaron's rod, and the precepts, the tables of the law. In Christ, you have not only the bread from heaven, you have Christ who goes beyond Aaron as a priest. He is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. That's all of chapter 7. And then in the tables of the law, you have Christ himself is called the living word, the word of God. 
the tabernacle cries out Jesus and Emmanuel. God is with us. God is teaching his people through this. There is a point to all the regulation, to the rules. Now this too becomes very close to home with those of us that are in Christ. We too, as temples of God, also bear this imagery. We being many are described as one bread. We are kings and priests. We have the engrafted, the implanted word of God, which is able to save our souls. We are living sacrifices. So do not think tonight that this is some discourse of something very distant, non-practical, irrelevant. This is who you are as well. You're in Christ. You bear his image. So as we learn about Christ and what he has done in going into the most holy place, remember that you're there too. And Brother Given will show us more of that when the time comes. Now, the, now verse 6 and following. Now when these things had been thus prepared, the priests continually entering the outer tabernacle, performing the divine worship. But into the second, only the high priest enters, and that, think about this, once a year, not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing, which is a symbol for the present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience. Here's why. They relate only to food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until a time of reformation. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. There's a contrast. You're going to see this all the way through. Listen for it. This is the way it was. This is the way it is. That's what this priest was like. This is what Christ is like. That's what this sacrifice was like. This is what Christ is like. This is the earthly tabernacle. This is the greater tabernacle. Now, why do they talk about blood? Blood, 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 all the way through here. Talks about the blood of Christ. Hardly ever talks about the death of Christ. There's a reason why. God has established his own lexicon in the Old Covenant. He's got people familiar with blood. Amen. Now, uh, a disease can yield death, but a disease may not yield a sacrifice. There's a Amen. difference. Christ more than died, he was an offering. And so God, knowing the mind of his people, knowing what he's established in the old with the use of the word blood, now draws this to our minds by the, by the word of the Spirit through Paul. It is the blood of Christ. Yes, certainly not that he bled to death, as someone noted earlier, or that it's the, the chemical element itself. No, that, that's not it. Uh, in fact, that wasn't it in the old covenant either. The actual chemical elements of the animals as it was spilled upon the altar. That wasn't the point then either. So, of course, it wouldn't be just the uh, hematology of Christ that would uh, yield this. Now, the, the word for blood also points specifically to a life intentionally offered. That's important. Amen. To a sacrifice. It was not, was not accidental. It was intentional. Amen. The life is in the blood. So when the blood is shed, the life is lost. It is poured out. We will come back to this later. For Christ, no man took his life from him, and no spirit being either for that matter. Amen. Nothing in God's creation took his life from him. He gave it up. He offered it up. Now, I can offer my life, but I can't take it back up. I would have to die for my own sins. Mm -hmm. That would be the end of the matter. I would have died. But Christ being sinless, he could offer his life and take it back because he had been without sin. Now this next section, beginning in verse 13. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, how much more will this cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Amen. Your conscience can be purged, cleaned out, just like you would clean out something when you think about a pipe system or whatever and you just want to purge it and clean it out, that's what can happen to your mind. Defiling causes clogging in your, in your spirit. 
You can purge that out. It is the blood of Christ that does that. And for this reason, he's the mediator of a new covenant in order that since the death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal, of the eternal inheritance. Now, I know we're reading a, a lot of text tonight. Now, that's very biblical too. Paul said not to neglect that, the public reading of Scripture. Uh, but we are, we are going to talk more about this. I want to establish in your minds very firmly where, where he is going with this, what he is talking about here. For where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. For a covenant is valid only when men are dead, for it is never enforced while the one who made it lives. Therefore, even the first covenant was not inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment had been spoken by, by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and the goats, with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people saying this is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you and in the same way he sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry with the blood and according to the law one may almost say all things are cleansed with blood and without shedding of blood there is no forgiveness now some of you may be familiar with uh, different theories out there that talk about a construction of a millennial temple you have to replace these other temples that have gone on and, and they take some prophecies and make them that there's going to be this millennial temple during a thousand year reign on earth and say that there will be animal sacrifices reinstituted. Now for the life of me, I cannot understand where people get this. I, you go back into the Old Covenant, first of all, the texts they pick are not that clear. You would think from what they say that, well, it's obvious, and why, how have I missed this conclusion? No, it's very loose, very loose references, but also, at the very least, what does the book of Hebrews say? What has Paul been talking about all the way through the entire book of Hebrews is that that's over with, that's done, it served its purpose, Christ is here. I'm not sure that you could even have Christ and animal sacrifices in the same realm. He's a lamb as has been slain. Amen. It, it, defies, Amen. it defies my, un, my understanding. And, and I also do want to level this charge. There are people that come in the name of Christ and claim to have the word of faith, and they have all manner of, of gems that they offer, like Satan defeated Jesus at the cross and other great uh, blasphemies that they spout. Uh, this new theory is the old heresy. It, it's the same thing we've seen before. But these texts talk about these very issues when what we've been going through here does address that. Here's a, a, a point of advice for you. If, if the men who did see into heaven, like Paul and John, if they didn't talk like these people talk, there's a problem. And it's not our understanding of Paul and John. It's that they're claiming authority about things they don't have authority for. Now, that was my introduction. We're going to look more at the tabernacle. This is significant. Christ, by his own blood, has entered into the true tabernacle, that more perfect. That's what I want to look at now. So verse 11 and 12, verses 23 and 24, these all are going to be brought together. Christ appears the high priest, good things to come. He entered through the greater and more per perfect tabernacle, not the one made with hands. Now that's obvious if you just remember the gospel accounts of, the, of his passion, of his, the crucifixion. Well, his blood wasn't gathered by his disciples and, and ran down the hill over to uh, Jerusalem and presented in the temple. Why, why that never occurred. So that, you, you know that's not it. And there's a reason why. We're going to talk about that. And not through the blood of goats and calves, through his own blood. And he did it once. Now in verses 23 and 24, they, he gives you a little more detail. It was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with these. Talking about... Uh, the animal sacrifices, the copies were cleansed with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Now, now think about this, this greater tabernacle versus an earthly tabernacle. Sacrifices in the earthly tabernacle were for a limited time. It was for sins you'd previously committed or a certain type of sin required a certain type of sacrifice. They were limited. It was for a limited people. It was for God's, God's people, the Jews. You didn't have just anybody going to that temple or to that tabernacle. 
I know there were allowances for the strangers that lived among you, but you sure didn't have Medes and Persians coming in and participating in these things as, as well. It was not just for anyone. It's for the Jews. And it was also good only until the next sin. Okay, that took care of everything now, and then you sin again, then you need another sacrifice. You have to go and do some other thing because, because of the sin. It's limited. It's earthly tabernacle. The sacrifice presented in the greater tabernacle, however, was and is for all time. Not all future, all time. That's what it's talking about in verse 15. When Christ dies, it also forgives the sins that were committed under the first covenant. How could David be forgiven? Because Christ died. Not because he was a righteous, God-fearing man and he repented and turned. Those things enter in, no question about it. He wasn't a rebellious man like Saul. Big difference between the two. But it's because Christ died. Abraham, 2,000 years. Watch, I can't even conceive of that much time. 2,000 years. Jesus could say, he saw my day and was glad. There's a paraphrase. Abraham could see it. Why? Why did he have blessings from God? Because Christ was coming to die. Now we, we look back. We say, Christ died for us. His sacrifice is for all time. Not just what's coming up ahead. It's for all time. Amen. Now, I, I'm going to try and illustrate this uh, very common way. Baptism. Baptism is for the, the remission of your sins, for the forgiveness of sin. Acts 2.38 and elsewhere, no question about that. But there's people that have this idea that, well, I've been especially sinful. I, I, maybe it didn't take. Maybe I better be rebaptized and rebaptized and rebaptized is really how it ends up. We, we, somebody earlier talked about, you know, if that was the case, and, and I thought to myself, I'd always be wet because I'd had sin or maybe you'd even just be proud to look what I've done and then you got to go and do it again and then you're, maybe you're proud that you did that again and it, uh, C.S. Lewis talked about that it can be a never ending cycle it can be a trap now the sacrifice of Christ was also once that's why Ephesians can say there's one baptism there's one there, you know if you have been uh, immersed more than, more than uh, once and I, I know several that have uh, for various reasons, uh, valid reasons. I'm not deprecating that at all. But there was one. Out of those, there was one. They weren't all the same. You weren't doing the same thing each time. There was one. Now, Christ died once. That's the point. That's the point. Christ died once because it was for all time and it was for all the sins. And that's something very hard to get a hold of uh, in a carnal mind because the carnal mind thinks... I'm forgiven for stuff in the future too. Hooray! Let's get at it. God forbid. But that's how the carnal mind reasons. And that's why when you're talking to people about this, well, I've, I've been forgiven of all my sins. Not just the ones I've I committed in the past. Not just the ones that I'm, I'm wrestling with and, and still contending with. Not just ones that, that more than likely I, I'll, I'll have to repent of later. Things in the future. I'm forgiven of all of them. Not just the past. I'm forgiven of all of them. And it's because the sacrifice of Christ, as uh, some have said, the blood flows both ways, not just to the past. Now, the sacrifice presented in the greater tabernacle also is for all people. Uh, 1 John chapter 2, he talks about Christ, the propitiation for the sins of the whole world, not just us, sins of the whole world. So it's for all time, it's for all people. It's a greater tabernacle. And the sacrifice of Christ also has a continuing role. You see that in verse 24 into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nothing has changed since these words were written so long ago. He's still there. Not just now and that's completed and done, but now, this, this evening, right now, he is still in the presence of God uh, appearing for us. There is a continuing action of Christ here. He is a mediator. He is an intercessor. He is the daysman Job cried out for. Those are different, each one of those. We cannot go where Jesus has not gone. We could not go to heaven unless he had gone and prepared a place for us. Amen. Now you're beginning to see some of this Christ entered into the most holy place by his own blood. Christ is not a hireling. He is a good shepherd. He does not bring the blood of others. He brings his own blood. Amen. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Now, because Christ has entered the holiest of all, there's no other temple beyond that. No other tabernacle. Amen. If you refuse the sacrifice of Christ, not only is there no one else to be offered, there's nowhere else to go. There's no other place for them to present their blood. It is the holiest 
of all. There is no other tabernacle beyond the one that has already been cleansed by Christ. Now look at the last part of, of this chapter, please, 24 through 28. Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor was it that he should suffer, that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place, year by year, with blood not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now, once, at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, shall appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. Amen. Let's talk uh, uh, briefly here about sacrifice, because this enters directly in. And, and frankly, because none of the other messages really deal with this area, so we must deal with it here, and you will get a, a, a more out of the others that come tomorrow a sacrifice cannot bring you higher than the order of the object sacrificed in a sacrifice you have the worth of the item sacrificed imputed or attributed to the one on whose behalf it has been offered Amen. so the old covenant had bird and lamb and bull and other things that had to be offered and there was a scale there was a scale when you look back they, they weren't all treated the same there wasn't just one kind of sacrifice for all kinds of of uh, misdemeanors there was a scale just like not every sin uh, yielded uh, capital punishment for example some did not all did some you could pay fines and so on so think about this the old covenant had the bird the lamb the bull and other things the goat offered for the people the bull offered for the high priest you see a difference right there in the in the animal that's offered there were degrees of sacrifice uh, the purification for leprosy was not the same as for stealing. And I, I want to look at that. Uh, Leviticus 14. This is a great picture here. Way back in Leviticus, uh, which I remember hearing one time that, that in the old days, that's what the, the Hebrews used to train their children in first. Can you imagine your 11 and 12-year-olds being masters of Leviticus? I take my hat off to people that have committed themselves to the Word of God. Leviticus 14, verse 1. The Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought unto the priest. The priest shall go forth out of the camp. Notice that they're not in the camp. The priest shall look and behold, if the plague of leprosy be healed in leper, then he, the, shall the priest command to take him for, uh, for him that is to be cleansed two birds alive and clean, and cedar wood and scarlet and hyssop. And the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. As for the living bird, he shall take it and the cedar wood, and the scarlet, and the hyssop, and shall dip them and the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. And he shall sprinkle upon him that is to be cleansed from the leprosy seven times, and shall pronounce him clean, and shall let the living bird loose into the open field. Now there were two birds that were brought. Now just, just go with me on this, please. Imagine you don't know which one you are. There's two birds that are brought. They look the same. You don't know which one's going to be offered. You don't know which one's going to be set free. Well, we were the bird set free. There was someone else offered. There was someone else uh, whose blood has been <coughs> sprinkled upon us, whose blood we have been dipped in. We have been cleansed by the blood of the other and set free into the open field. Where we had once been scarlet from our own sins, now we wear the crimson of Christ. And if he sets us free... We are free indeed. <clears throat> Hebrews 10.1 talks about the same uh, theme that's been developed here, about the change between what was and what is. The law, since it was only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of the things, can never, by the same sacrifices year by year, which they offer continually, make perfect those who draw near. And others are going to develop uh, other elements of this verse. What I want you to see here, shadow of good things to come not the very form itself. What it had is true. What was there was from God. There is no superior covenant until a new covenant was given by God himself. In Hebrews 8.2 talks about Christ as a minister of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. Amen. Hebrews 8.5 talks about the earthly uh, priests who serve under the example and shadow 
of heavenly things. Uh, they were made according to the pattern, the mount. There is a change in the tabernacles. There is a change. Now again, the, the verses 9, 11, and 12, 23, and 24. That, those are the keys this evening. And a reminder, the sacrifice cannot transfer more worth than it has of itself. It cannot give you more benefit than it has to offer of itself. Amen. Now consider this. If a man remained under the system of bulls and goats, he would never be able to rise above the value of those animals. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't be able to. They are of a different order. As uh, uh, Brother Boyce brought, brought out earlier, they don't have a conscience. They're obviously different. We're in the image of God. So we must have a sacrifice that is at least equal to us, if not superior to us, if we are to rise above the animal order. The sin of man is a greater debt than the life of a beast could repay. You think of all the millions of lambs that were sacrificed during those years, and even my sin would not be covered by all those millions of animals. And there have been people who have have in one sense uh, had more sin than I have, and there's people that have had less sin than I have, and some of the people that have had more sin than me is because they've had more time than I've had too. But all those animals couldn't atone for my sin. I needed something more. Amen. So God provided his son. Christ has offered himself for man. He is not only a man, he is the son of man. And he's not only the son of man, he's the son of God. So he not only at least matches us, he's no animal, he's, he transcends us. He is the Son of God. Amen. Because he is the Son of Man, he can effectively minister grace and forgiveness to his brethren. He is one of us. Amen. He's, having Amen. suffered temptation, he's able to aid and help and succor those that are being tempted. And not only is he one of us, he is the Son of God. He can bring us beyond the created order and present us without blemish to the heavenly father he transcends us because of the sacrifice of christ our lives which can often seem so small are invested with great worth the, th the thing sacrificed for us was no thing at all but is a person and not just any person through the sacrifice of christ god has imputed to us the life value of his only begotten son thus the true atonement of mankind transcends the animal realm the creator has died for the creature. It wasn't just a host of creatures being offered and offered and offered. It was the creator. All things created by the word. Without him was not anything made that has been made. He is the one who paid the penalty for us. Amen. Animal blood is presented in an earthly sanctuary, but Christ's blood is presented in that greater tabernacle, the one the Lord pitched and not man. We needed a greater tabernacle because the blood of bulls and goats was of the lesser tabernacle and therefore could never take away our sin. The prophet Micah said, Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? You see the contrast? The sins were not just of my body, they were sins of my soul. I needed a greater atonement than just a fruit of my body could provide. Mm -hmm. Even, not only the firstling of my flocks, should I even offer my own child to cover my own sins, my firstborn, if you read it very personally, mm -hmm. it still wouldn't atone for the sins of my soul. Mm -hmm. I needed the Son of God offered to transcend Amen. me and to take me where I could not go of myself. Amen. The animals could never transcend the body level. They could never take away the sins of the soul. But Christ, the Son of God, the Son of Man, could take away the sins by his death. If my sin was against an idol in an earthly tabernacle, then perhaps animals would be appropriate. Their blood could be offered in the very temple where the God was, if I worshipped an idol. But my blood had to be presented where God himself was. I know God is everywhere, but Jesus also said, Heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool. There's a difference in God's presence everywhere and God's presence in heaven Amen. and so the blood of the only begotten son had to be presented there we needed a greater tabernacle because God that made the world and all things therein seeing he is Lord of heaven and earth dwells not in temples made with hands neither is worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything 
seeing he gives to all life and breath and all things. The blood of Christ had to be presented in a greater tabernacle to atone for my sin. He had to be in the presence of God. He had to go to the temple where God is. He had to go into heaven itself. And brethren, the blood of Christ never dries. Amen. He is a lamb slain. Not way slain in the past. And it's, well, oh, that's nice. It's some memorial, some mausoleum piece. He is a fresh sacrifice because our sins are fresh. Mm -hmm. It still has power. His blood does not dry. Amen. Without the sacrifice of Christ present in heaven, we could never go there. We could never go there. And now some final words as we close this evening. Imagine, imagine this. This is uh, not by any means uh, original with me, but I want you to imagine Christ after he has made his offering and he's being escorted back to the gates of heaven by some angelic escort. And the angels on the gates of heaven look out and they see this, this uh, parade of sorts coming. And they hear the angels that are with Christ shout, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. Mm -hmm. And they look out and they say, He doesn't look like the king of glory I remember. He doesn't look like he did when he left here, out of the ivory palaces, into a world of woe. Mm -hmm. He's got a bruise on his heel. He doesn't look like he did when he left here. Mm -hmm. who, who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Mm -hmm. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Our champion, brethren, has returned from his journey to the underworld, having slain the twin Goliaths of sin and guilt, and is now enthroned at the right hand of the majesty on high, anticipating his return. His eyes are a flame of fire, and upon his head are many diadems. And he has a name written upon him which no one knows except himself. Amen. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may smite the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty." And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And it says in the prophet Isaiah, it shall be said in that day when Christ comes like that again. Amen. Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him.